In recent months, the FBI has come under criticism for its handling of various FISA warrant applications, as well as its counterintelligence investigations. However, this is hardly an irregularity. Throughout its history, the FBI has repeatedly been the source of scandal due to how it has abused its intelligence and national security powers. I'm Chip Gibbons, Policy Director for Defending Rights and Dissent. I'm also a journalist and researcher who has published articles about FBI abuses of power for The Intercept, In These Times, Jacobin, the Nation, and Washington Post. I recently, along with Defending Rights and Dissent, published the report, Still Spying on Dissent, The Enduring Problems of FBI First Amendment Abuse. This is a podcast looking at the issue of FBI First Amendment abuse, and the enduring problem of political surveillance in this country. Later in this episode, I'm going to be joined by Emily Berman. Emily, in addition to being a Defending Rights and Dissent board member, is an assistant professor of law at the University of Houston's Law Center. We're going to be discussing the Attorney General guidelines, one of the many attempts to reform the FBI's conduct over the years. However, first, since last time we talked about the 112-year history of FBI First Amendment abuse, we're going to be talking this time about the history of attempts to rein in and reform the FBI as it relates to the FBI's predilection for political surveillance. The very first attempt to address FBI political surveillance was in 1924. It was made by Attorney General Harlan Fisk Stone. Stone forced J. Edgar Hoover to meet with Roger Baldwin, the founder of the American Civil Liberties Union. The ACLU had published a report accusing the Department of Justice of having a domestic spying apparatus. Stone told Hoover that he could not investigate matters that were not violations of the federal criminal code. This is a frequent way to try to reform the FBI. As Stone pointed out to Hoover, it was not a crime to hold left-wing or communist views. While this reform was put in place, these checks were stripped back during the ensuing years, allowing the FBI to again gain its intelligence powers. A particularly interesting episode in the history of attempts at FBI reform comes in 1949, when Judith Copeland was put on trial for espionage. When she was arrested, she had FBI documents in her purse, making them central to her trial. A judge ordered the documents to be produced at trial, but the FBI objected. They would prefer to dismiss the case than allow these documents to become public. The DOJ, however, wanted to prosecute Copeland, so they went through with it. These documents didn't compromise national security, but they did reveal FBI surveillance of the political activities of a number of private citizens, as well as a number of other First Amendment abuses. In a second trial of Copeland, the FBI conceded it had tapped her phone and potentially listened to her conversations with her attorneys. Needless to say, both of her convictions were overturned by higher courts on appeal. These revelations greatly interested the National Lawyers Guild, a progressive bar association formed by lawyers who opposed the American Bar Association for being segregated and because the ABA opposed the New Deal. The National Lawyers Guild tried to get Truman to investigate these matters, but when he refused, they decided to conduct their own investigation, issuing their own report. The National Lawyers Guild itself was a victim of FBI dirty tricks. The FBI was engaged in illegal wiretaps, it had informants amongst Guild members, and as the FBI later conceded in a lawsuit filed by the National Lawyers Guild, it broke into their office at least 14 times. The FBI wanted to head off the Guild's investigation, so it began supplying derogatory information about them to members of the Truman administration. It also started supplying information to the House Un-American Activities Committee. On the day before an NLG press conference about its report that was to be released, Richard Nixon, then a member of HUAC, staged his own press conference calling for an investigation of the National Lawyers Guild. HUAC released its investigation under the title Legal Bulwark of the Communist Party. It attacked the NLG as following the Moscow line on the ground that it had called for an investigation of the FBI and accused the FBI of being a political police, working with HUAC, and engaging in illegal surveillance. The FBI was, of course, engaged in illegal surveillance against the Guild, hence why it was able to head off this investigation, and it was, in fact, cooperating with HUAC in order to smear them. Historian Ellen Schreckner, the foremost historian of the McCarthy period, calls the Guild's report the most serious attempt to investigate the FBI until Watergate. However, thanks to the FBI smearing of its critics, this report had no impact. In 1971, though, 
a different group decided to investigate the FBI. Calling itself the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI, a group of anti-war activists who viewed FBI surveillance as an existential threat to their movement, broke into the Media Pennsylvania FBI office and liberated documents revealing the existence of the FBI's COINTEL program. This revelation, along with other revelations about covert operations, both domestic and foreign, and the controversy surrounding the Watergate scandal, led to a new era of congressional oversight. In the Senate, the Church Committee was formed to investigate intelligence agency abuses, including those domestic abuses by the FBI. The Church Committee recommended that the FBI have a charter for its intelligence operations. However, to this day, no charter has been put in place. Instead, the Attorney General issued guidelines that put limits on the FBI's powers. However, since the Attorney General can issue those guidelines, any Attorney General can change them. Unsurprisingly, Attorney Generals during the Reagan and Bush administration weakened the guidelines to make them substantially less protective of civil liberties. No attorney general, once the guidelines have been weakened, has ever returned them to their earlier state. In the 1980s, the FBI was still up to political surveillance. It spied on the committee in solidarity with the people of El Salvador. When this investigation came to light, six agents were disciplined, and the Senate did its own investigation and report on the FBI's action. The Senate also, as a result of this, asked the General Accountability Office to review FBI international terrorism investigations. One of the questions raised by the GAO review, did these international terrorism investigations impact the First Amendment rights of U.S. persons? The GAO could make no determination. After the CISPIS revelations, Congressman Don Edwards pushed for the FBI First Amendment Protection Act. If passed, this act would have required that the FBI have specific and articulable facts reasonably indicating the subject of an investigation has engaged in, is engaging, or about to engage in a federal criminal offense. While this act never passed, Edwards was able to get language inserted into the 1994 crime bill barring the FBI from investigating First Amendment protected activity, or solely investigating that activity. The 1996 Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, however, repealed that provision. For those of you keeping track at home, that provision was on the books for less than 16 months. September 11th resulted in new laws like the Patriot Act being passed, making surveillance much easier. And as mentioned before, Bush's attorney generals loosened the guidelines in ways that made them almost unrecognizable from what they originally were. In 2006, in response to FOIA requests revealing FBI surveillance of civil society groups, Congress asked the Office of the Attorney General and the Department of Justice to investigate. Four years later, that report was released and was critical of the FBI's conduct. But just days after that report was released in 2010, the FBI was raiding the homes of anti-war and solidarity activists across the Midwest. So for today's podcast to talk about attempts to reform the FBI, I'm joined by Emily Berman. Emily is an assistant professor of law at the University of Houston's Law Center. Her scholarship explores the relationship among government institutions and the development implementation, and oversight of national security policy. She is also a board member of the Defending Rights and Dissent and authored Domestic Intelligence, New Powers, New Risk for the Brennan Center. So just to start off, and this might seem like a, a basic question, but I, I feel like for a lot of people who think of the FBI as like the police, but a federal police force, this might be a bit of a surprise. What exactly is the Federal Bureau of Investigation? Well, currently, it is primarily an intelligence agency, um, and it's actually one of the, the interesting things about the FBI as, as an institution is that it has really swung back and forth over the course of its existence between being primarily focused on, on crime solving and being more focused on intelligence collection. And that has been true since, the, since its inception in the early 1900s. But um, in the wake of 9-11, it really shifted strongly uh, towards the intelligence collection side of its mission. And that, that remains its sort of primary role for itself. And for people who might not be familiar with the distinction, how does intelligence differ from, from crime solving or, or law enforcement? So when you're investigating a crime, you have a very concrete set of questions that you're asking. You are trying to, to solve the crime and you're looking for evidence 
uh, presumably for some future prosecution of a criminal. So you're looking for evidence of the various elements of the crime. Uh, intelligence investigations tend to be broader than that simply because you don't really know what it is you're looking for. You're just looking for things that provide you with insight with respect to the motives and actions of whoever your targets are. Uh, and so they tend to, they're not necessarily tied to any particular criminal activity or any particular threat. And they often cover more broadly sort of inquiries into the nature of various organizations, their membership, their financing, uh, that sort of thing, just to, to try to get a, an understanding of the broader landscape rather than being really targeted on, you know, answering a question, you know, who committed this crime or is there a crime that is currently being planned? So do intelligence investigations then pose sort of a, a greater threat to civil liberties than traditional law enforcement investigations? Um, yeah, historically, I think that's that's definitely a fair characterization, just because anytime you give the government broader discretion to act, then you're opening up the possibility that that discretion is going to be abused. And so because of the more amorphous nature of intelligence investigations, sort of by definition, there's more discretion being exercised. And so it definitely provides the opportunity for, for abuse in a way that, that a laser focus on a crime does not. And historically, sort of the more well-known FBI abuses like COINTELPRO, which is literally counterintelligence program, took place under under the rubric of its intelligence powers, not not its law enforcement powers. So if the FBI is an intelligence agency, how does it compare to the other sort of foreign intelligence agencies in terms of its powers and the sort of source of its authority? Yeah, so so sort of broadly speaking... The FBI is the domestic intelligence agency, and the CIA is the foreign or the extraterritorial investigation agency, as it were. And that that's not so much necessarily focused on where the targets of the investigation are, but more on where the entity is operating. So the FBI does all of the, the collection activities that are going to happen inside the United States, and the CIA primarily does does the same outside of the United States. There are exceptions to that and overlapping places. The, the FBI has hundreds of agents stationed around the world in various illegal um, attaches. <laughs> yeah. So right. So um so that, that domestic um foreign distinction doesn't isn't watertight, but that's sort of how the respective roles of the entities are are perceived. So and all of that comes from the there's an executive order on intelligence collection, fondly known as E triple E twelve triple three. So it's the executive order one two three three three. And that order lays out the various agencies within the intelligence community and what their roles are and some of the details of their operations. And so um, so it is based on a, a presidential executive order that, that assigns these roles to the FBI. But in, in terms of their origins, though, the CIA actually had a congressional charter, whereas the FBI did not. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So the CIA was created in the wake of World War II in a statute that did various things, in, including creating the Department of Defense and consolidating what had been um, the different branches. Yeah. And then the Department of the Navy was separate. So it consolidated all of the, the military into the Department of Defense, but it also created the CIA, which was sort of an offshoot of the OSS that had been the intelligence agency during during the war. So some of their their responsibilities and limits on their authorities comes from from that statute, and then there that's expanded upon in various executive orders and policies that we aren't privy to. The FBI, by contrast, was just created by the Attorney General as an investigative bureau to enforce the, the federal law such as it existed in you know, 1908, 1909, and never has been set up with a legislative charter. 
it was recommended that a legislative charter for the FBI be drafted in the late 70s after COINTELPRO um, that you mentioned before and, and many other sort of abuses of various intelligence collection authorities by various government agencies. One of the recommendations that came out of that investigation was that the FBI should be subject to a statutory charter that laid out its authorities and imposed some limits on its investigative powers. There were various drafts that went around, and ultimately the Attorney General and and Congress couldn't reach consensus, so nothing was ever actually passed into law. So if there's no congressional charter, what is the source of the main limitations on the FBI's powers? So these are all, they're they're a series of um, internal guidelines. So, for example, the draft of the FBI charter, when Congress failed to actually enact it as a statute, the attorney general then unilaterally implemented it as internal guidelines. So they've become known as the attorney general guidelines, specifically the attorney general guidelines for domestic FBI operations. Uh, There are various sets of guidelines that they have a, a set of guidelines for undercover activities. They have a set of guidelines for the use of confidential informants, but the the guidelines for domestic FBI operations are sort of lay out sort of the basic rules of various types of investigations and what techniques the FBI has available to it in its investigation. And these guidelines are put into place in the late 70s, but they the guidelines still to this day remain the main sort of a way to regulate the FBI. How have they changed over the years since the 70s? What's been the general general trend with, with the guidelines? Well, they've definitely um, become much less restrictive over time. The original guidelines, which were focused on responding to the abuses that had been exposed, really limited, tied, tied FBI activities very closely to criminal activity. So this was one, when I sort of speak of the pendulum going back and forth between intelligence collection and, and crime solving, This the, the original guidelines really pulled the Bureau much more toward the crime-solving direction. Uh, And as subsequent attorney generals came into office, they made various types of modifications. The overall trend has been more limited oversight, more expansive powers at earlier stages of the investigation, and less connection to criminal activity. So they've just gotten much more permissive along a variety of different axes over time. And it's actually, it's interesting to think about that in the context of, you know, what we were talking about before with respect to having a a statutory charter and not. The Attorney General guidelines were created at about the same time that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act was passed. So that was another statute that came out of these investigations into the, the intelligence community. Of course, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is not is not perfect and it has been expanded in some ways, but the basic rules surrounding electronic surveillance for foreign intelligence purposes have remained the same since 1978 when that law was passed. And so the fact that it was statutory really had the effect of embedding in the law this sort of stricter vision of limitations on the intelligence community in a way that that didn't happen in the FBI because they retain the possibility of of modifying these guidelines over time, which they in fact have done. When were the current guidelines that are currently put in place? When were they put in place and and who who authored them? Yes, the current guidelines were put in place at the very tail end of the Bush administration. So in in 2008, um, when Attorney General Michael Mukasey was in office, and he is the one that drafted them. The guidelines had already been modified after 9-11 once when Attorney General John Ashcroft was in office. He issued his own set of guidelines that were themselves much more focused on intelligence collection and, and much more permissive. And then, you know, six, seven years later, Michael Mukasey took them another step further, implemented those in 2008, and those have been in effect ever since then. And these guidelines were sort of a dramatic departure from, from the previous ones? In a couple of ways, they are a dramatic departure. So 
the fundamental structure of the guidelines ever since they were put in place in the, in the late 70s was that the FBI had to meet a certain level of what's called predication uh, in order to open an investigation. In other words, there has to be some factual predicate, some reason to think that further investigation is warranted before you're allowed to sort of you know unleash the investigative power of the FBI on to a person or uh, an organization. And there were always sort of different stages of investigations, preliminary investigations versus limited investigations versus full investigations. And they all had their own rules for when they could be opened. And the, f the further you got along that line toward a full investigation, the more investigative techniques became available to you. So for example, when the original guidelines went into place, you couldn't use confidential informants unless you had opened a full investigation. So if the investigation was just a preliminary investigation, you didn't have a whole lot of, of evidence you're starting off with, you couldn't use confidential informants then. So the big change that the Mukasey guidelines initiated was it created an investigative step prior to predicated investigations known as an assessment. And an assessment is a type of investigative stage that requires no predication. In some ways, it, it's sort of an oxymoron because the whole idea of an investigation is that it's predicated on something. The assessments don't need any sort of factual predication so long as they are being conducted pursuant to an authorized purpose, which is essentially to carry, to obtain information about or protect uh, against federal crimes or threat to the national security or to collect foreign intelligence. And at the assessment level, what kinds of techniques can be used? Yeah, so that is, I guess, another way um, that the McKinsey guidelines are different. So one one sort of stark difference is that you can use confidential informants at the assessment stage. So it's something that used to be reserved for the most sort of highly justified investigations, the investigations that were based on the most information, now are permitted in the absence of any information that has triggered an investigation. So that's probably the most intrusive technique available um, during assessments, but there are others as well. You can engage in 24-hour physical surveillance of someone. So you can put someone under 24-hour surveillance, follow them around everywhere they go. You can conduct what are called pretext interviews, which are interviews conducted by agents without identifying themselves as FBI agents. So they can go talk to your neighbor, your coworkers, your boss, your family members, and they don't have to be forthcoming about who they are or why they're there even in the absence of any indication that the investigation's target has done anything wrong or poses a threat of any kind. So those are pretty, pretty intrusive techniques then, and they don't require any sort of factual predicate. So what are the implications under the current guidelines for First Amendment protected activity? Yeah, it's a um, it's been a huge problem. It's been a consistent problem throughout the FBI's history. Because when you're conducting intelligence, you're looking for threats to the state, basically. Um, you're looking for terrorists. You're looking for you know people who want to spark a communist revolution. And so inevitably, that leads you to people who express political ideas contrary to those of the state that are that's currently in power. So political dissenters have historically been recurring target for the FBI, and that was true uh, in the 70s. They were focused on um, the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. And Chip, as you know, um, your more recent report has documented yes. the way that, that has just continued in recent years. And there, one thing that one interesting thing with respect to the guidelines and, and First Amendment issues is that the the Ashcroft guidelines in 2001, so immediately post 9/11, really sort of rolled back the kinds of protections that there had been for First Amendment protected activity. So there had been particular rules in the guidelines that were designed to protect from investigation First Amendment protected activity unless there was a reason. So whether that be religious services or political rallies, etc. 
And so in 2001, those were essentially eliminated, and the FBI is permitted to participate in any of those types of activities. Uh, the rule is sort of on the same terms as any other member of the public. So if it is a you know public protest, the FBI can show up, they can look around at who's there, they can listen to what's happening with no need to have any particular reason for being there. Uh, and they have made use of that authority, <laughs> as you know. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's hard to know. You sort of get occasional FOIA requests that, that reveal that, you know, they were investigating Greenpeace or they were investigating anti-nuclear um, weapons group. But, you know, that just means we know that there's there's an iceberg under the water. You know, there's yeah. a tip. And, and if you're finding that in FOIA requests, then you know it's going on quite a bit. And it's unclear exactly what they're doing, but they no. do keep all of the information that they glean. And so the likelihood that activities of, you know, political activists get documented in FBI databases is sort of an inevitable outgrowth of, of those rules. And it can take a long time to uncover these investigations. I spent half a decade trying to get the FBI and finally had to, had to sue them uh, to release files about their surveillance of nonviolent Palestinian solidarity activists from the Bush years, right? This was surveillance that happened in 2005, 2006. I filed the FOIA request in 2015. The FBI did not release the information to me until 2019, which then when you have these sorts of documents, people say, oh, that's a long time ago. But then, you know, what's happening now? But you don't find out what's happening now until, until 10 years on. Bit of a grievance yeah. on my part. I, yeah, I don't, I don't blame you. It doesn't, I think, doesn't FOIA have like a 20-day <laughs> timeline? Yeah, yeah, there's uh -huh. the answer to 20 days. Uh, I would... <laughs> what a joke. But the other uh, thing about it is because we don't know, that affects the way that people behave, right? When you know that the federal authorities have the power to watch things that you might be participating in, it might you might decide not to go. You might decide not to speak. You might decide to say something differently than you otherwise would have said. And so even the the existence of the power itself is going to have a chilling effect on First Amendment protected activity, you know, whether or not the FBI is actually doing anything that we might object to. And and what do the current guidelines say about racial profiling or even opening an investigation based on First Amendment protected speech? So the guidelines say that you cannot open an investigation based solely on First Amendment protected activity. But the word solely does a lot of work there. And so, you know, it can't be that you go to a particular mosque that the FBI suspects is, you know, preaching radicalization. Like that alone is not going to be enough. But that plus just about anything else is going to then lead into the scenario where the FBI will say, well, it's not solely First Amendment protected activities that they go to this mosque and, you know, they travel to, to Pakistan or, you know, any any number of other possibly, probably innocent activities that the FBI somehow deems as suspicious. And then when you, you can combine that with First Amendment protected activity, and that's perfectly okay. And racial profiling? Oh, so racial profiling is similar. that so, so the official policy, the FBI has a policy on racial profiling, and it says that you can't make law enforcement decisions on the basis of race or ethnicity. But those guidelines have always had a national security exception, which essentially says in that context, these guidelines don't apply. You can use race and ethnicity to the extent that the Constitution permits it. And as you may know from criminal procedure constitutional decisions, that doesn't create a whole lot of restrictions on what the FBI can do. So so while it's the FBI's policy not to make decisions on that basis, it certainly can, just like First Amendment protected activity, can form part of the reason that they're focused on a particular person or a particular community. And in fact, they they do that. They they do what um, they do. It's called geomapping of various ethnic 
and religious communities so that they know, you know, in this particular part of town, there are, this is where there's the mosques are, or this is where primarily Muslim schools are, or Muslim owned businesses. So when, when race is sort of deemed relevant to the criminal profile, quote unquote, it's allowed to be taken into account. So the very first, one of the very first attempts to sort of stop the FBI from engaging political surveillance is as early as 1924, when the then Attorney General Harlan Fisk Stone tries to limit them to just investigating criminal activities. We've discussed today in the 1970s, the Attorney General put guidelines in place to try to prevent those types of abuses in response to revelations about domestic intelligence abuses uh, in the 1980s after it came out that the FBI had spied on opponents of Ronald Reagan's foreign policy. Uh, Congress debated and considered passing something called the FBI First Amendment Protection Act. It, it never passes, but some of the language from it is put in the 1994 crime bill and then repealed less than 16 months later. Part of perhaps my favorite named bill of all time, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. So I guess, Emily, my question for you is, where do we go from here? We, we've had these guidelines. They've, they've clearly been watered down. What is what is the road to sort of making it more difficult for the FBI to engage in the type of political surveillance it's been notorious for? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because it's not something that I've had a lot of optimism about over the years. It's not something that people tend to be on there. I think think they think of it largely as, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong. And so why should I worry? The FBI, you know, the FBI is focused on the terrorists not on me, not necessarily realizing that that may or may not be the case. But the flip um, side of that, though, is that in a lot of activist circles or people who are sort of more politically aware, the assumption is just that the FBI is always spying on people like they did during the Hoover era and that they're always going to spy on people. Right. So like the one the one sort of perspective is like FBI doesn't do anything wrong. I never do anything bad, so I don't have to worry the other perspective is like, well, the FBI is just the political police by their nature, and that's never gonna, never gonna change. Right, but be, but because that perspective is in the minority, there just hasn't been, you know, the, the groundswell of the sort of public pressure that would be necessary for things to change. But the current moment is actually sort of unique in that sense, with the sort of manufactured outrage on the right about the investigation into the Trump administration and their ties to, to Russia during the election. Now, all of a sudden, you've got people uh, on both sides of the aisle that are questioning what the FBI has been doing. And even as recently as, as yesterday, when the attorney general announced that he's not going to pursue criminal charges against Michael Flynn, the former national security advisor who, who lied to the FBI about his contacts with the Russian ambassador, his, the attorney general's argument is, well, there was no predication for this investigation to begin with. And so the whole investigation is bogus. And I and feel like with with the Carter Page investigation, he said that the intrusive techniques used were not warranted by by the degree of predication. So these are exactly. two high profile and- investigations in like three months where the attorney general has questioned the predication. And not only that, but people sort of in a, a similar uh, phenomenon, the outrage over the Carter Page electronic surveillance under FISA has gotten people up in arms about, you know, whether the FISA warrant was something that had sufficient evidence to support it. And to to those people, I say, well, welcome to my world where <laughs> You look at the FBI and say they have enormous powers that aren't always required to be based in factual circumstances that raise questions about crimes or threats, and yet that they're allowed to engage in those sorts of activities. And so if all of these phenomenon that has come up recently sort of spark a a larger debate about what is it that we want the FBI to be permitted to do and when are their tactics too intrusive 
And when are the predicates for opening investigations too low? And when are the standards for establishing probable cause under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act too permissive? Like that's a a long overdue conversation in my view. And so we can hope that at this moment, provides that opportunity. I'm not holding my breath because that would require a rational political discussion and compromise among people who view these things through very different lenses. But it has at least raised the possibility that there there could be some changes in what I would call the right direction. I mean, Barr was literally attorney general once before under George H.W. Bush when the guidelines were much more stringent. The fact that he keeps talking about predication, he could, in theory, you know, go back to the previous guidelines that I don't think he complained about when he was attorney general under George H.W. Bush. Anyways, Emily, thank you for joining us. Uh, It was great to talk to you. This is Chip Gibbons again, and thank you for listening to our podcast, Still Spying. During my introduction of this episode, I made a minor error. I was talking about a report that was done by the Department of Justice Office of the Inspector General, which I mistakenly referred to as the Office of the Attorney General. If you're interested in this OIG report and its ramifications, as well as the larger history of the FBI and the failures to reform it, please check out our report, Still Spying on Dissent, the Enduring Problem of FBI First Amendment Abuse, which you can find at rightsanddissent.org backslash FBI dash spying. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I hope you'll listen to our next episode, which asks the question, is all policing political? (music) 